traction engines at work, doing the jobs they were designed to do. These engines here are at the Great Dorset Steam Fair. It's the world's largest traction engine rally. Engines come from all over Great Britain to perform the tasks they did in years gone by. The traction engine used to be the backbone of British industry. They were used for all the tasks that these days we take for granted with the push of a button or the turn of a key on the farms, building roads, and hauling loads from town to town. Their place was unique in the early part of this century. This is the heavy haulage section, where the engines really have to earn their keep. Each day, during the show, the heavy haulage men work hard. Over the years, they've acquired trailers, bogies, and a whole range of tackle, so they can put on an authentic show for the public. Just imagine that lot driving down your street first thing in the morning. Every year, the load that the heavy haulage men use changes. This particular load doesn't really weigh that much, but it looks good, and that's what counts. They're an interesting breed, these heavy haulage lot. We'll have a closer look at them later in the programme. When these engines were working for a living, you would hardly ever see a clean and shiny one. These were working tools, mucky things, that would occasionally get a rub down with an oily rag, if they were lucky. The average day for a traction engine would normally start in the early hours of the morning. Just imagine waking up on a winter's morning to get steam up, ready for a day of hard graft in the fields or out on the road. From the lighting of the fire to having a good head of steam would normally take a couple of hours. So your average steam man would normally get the fire going and then retire for breakfast and a pot of tea. Then. When the engine was blowing off nicely, he would give the wife a kiss, put on his cap, all steam men wore a cap, jump up on the footplate and drive off in a puff of smoke and steam. And they probably wouldn't return till late in the evening.
There are all types and makes of traction engines, Fowler, Burrell, McLaren, Wallace and Stevens, to name but a few. There was hot competition between these manufacturers to get orders for their tackle. And, for many years, these factories were working flat out to get the engines to the customers. When you think that before the traction engines came along, most tasks were done by horses, it's no wonder that the order books at traction engine factories were full. These farmers and contractors wanted an easier life, and the traction engine was to them the answer. On delivery day, there are stories of farmers putting on their best suit and going to collect their new engine, then walking out through the towns and villages in front of the engine, chest stuck out as if to say, look what I've got. I suppose it would be a very proud day taking possession of one of these beauties. They were also used as a tool of leisure in the fairgrounds. Many people saw their first ever electric light at the fairground, and the bioscope shows were the forerunner to the cinemas of today. Showman's engines would pull the rides from town to town, then assist to set the rides up, and then power them with electricity with the huge dynamo that is usually situated on the front of the engine. As the years went by, traction engines were being developed to do all sorts of tasks. Look at this, and imagine trying to explain how it works. The inventors of many of these implements must have had incredible brains for the times they lived in. And there again, I suppose that's why Great Britain was once the workshop to the world. building houses, making barns, or knocking together a new gate. This is how your wood was cut. Traction engine at one end, and a saw bench at the other, both joined together by a canvas belt. It takes some work getting the saw bench and the engine aligned, but once the two are joined together, that belt will stay put for days. This saw bench is being worked by the late Beano Hill and his assistant, the Crowman. They're experts in their own right. Before his death, Beano Hill had been working these saw benches all his working life. He considered himself lucky that he only lost one finger. Now this is a portable engine. These machines preceded many of the traction engines that could travel on the roads by their own steam. 
a portable, would normally be hauled to work by horses. This engine is operating two saw benches, both fairly modern compared to the one you have just seen Beano Hill working. The engine doesn't use much coal because most of the waste timber is used as firewood. It's an interesting process, is this. First you get your raw material, a tree trunk. The tree is then positioned carefully on the saw bed and jostled into position. Once secured, it mechanically cuts the wood. Because of the size of these saw blades, many were used for making coffin lids. And you may remember those old black and white movies with the ladies strapped to the saw bed as the blade got nearer. There were many accidents with these saw benches and people lost fingers, hands and sometimes arms while working with them. So it's only skilled people that are allowed to work these old benches today. While the large bench cuts the wood for gate posts, the smaller bench cuts fence poles, all powered by steam. And what about that for a quality piece of timber? This is steam ploughing. Two engines at far ends of a field and a plough or cultivator between the two engines attached to a wire rope. Much of the ploughing tackle used at the turn of the century was built by John Fowlers of Leeds. These engines are huge and have a distinctive rattle as they work the land. As you can see, there is a massive winch drum under the belly of the engine. This is connected to the plough, which is pulled across the field. These engines took over from horse ploughing, so it's little wonder that there was a long waiting list to purchase one. All the farmers wanted this equipment. Some of these engines are still working today, so for all our modern machines, there still is nothing quite like the Fowler ploughs for dredging lakes and ploughing very soft soil. Quite a few of these engines were involved in boiler explosions and there are stories of men being blown 80 feet in the air before their death. But the usual findings of the government boiler inspectors was that the safety valve had been replaced by a bolt. This made the engines work harder and made the steam last longer, but there was a human cost for cheating.
When you sit on one of these ploughs, it's actually very quiet. It's only as you near the engines that you hear much noise. John Fowler was a peaceful man, a Quaker, and his aim in life was to see that every underdeveloped country in the world had his ploughs and cultivators, so that there would be no more famine in the world. It's a nice thought, but John died in a riding accident in his mid-forties, so his dream was never realised. Steam threshing. If you want to see steam threshing performed how it was done in your grandfather's day, then I suggest you take a trip to the great Dorset Steam Fair. The show has been running for a few decades now and it really is a massive working museum to how things used to be done. Threshing is basically separating the corn from the straw. This little engine is called Goliath and is owned by Dr Giles Romanis, an eminent eye surgeon. Giles finds it a great pastime to work this engine and says it relieves the day-to-day -day stresses he has to endure. Once you have harvested your corn, you make it into huge corn ricks. Then the contractors would come and thresh it for you. It was hard and dusty work. The bales are fed into the top of the thresher where the corn is separated from the straw. corn comes out of one end and the straw the other. The straw is then forked into this rather interesting baler.
The engine men had to be careful when threshing because there was always a risk of fire. So great care was made to check which way the wind was blowing. And the man on the traction engine had to have a keen eye on what he was doing. One spark, then a farmer could easily lose his whole crop. Road making the old way. This is a stone crusher, working in a similar way to how he saw the wood sawing and threshing earlier. Lumps of rock and brick put into the crusher, which then crushes it to a working size. When the rocks are too big for the crusher, a more traditional method is used. The road contractors would usually leave home for three months at a time. They lived where they worked, in living wagons at the side of the road. It was a long and hard job, and the pay was quite poor. The early roads were just stone and brick, rolled until it was flat. Imagine driving your new BMW over this.
Rollers were the last traction engines to work. They still had a role to play as late as the 1960s. Then progress came in the shape of the diesel road roller and they were scrapped or put into preservation. It's interesting that the first 50 miles of the M1 motorway was constructed using steamrollers. It's always nice to see traction engines on the road. This borough, named the Duke of Kent, is being driven by the late Steve Neville on his last road run before he died. A keen preservationist was Steve, who drove traction engines on the road more than any other man in preservation. Graham Love from Crouch in Derbyshire is another man who believes in driving his engine on the road. This Fowler road locomotive is named Excelsior. There are moves in Europe to stop these engines going on the road. Wouldn't it be a shame if you could no longer see a sight like this?
Now, as promised, let's have another look at these heavy haulage men in action. This load here is 60 tonnes of Portland granite. The trailer weighs 30 tonnes, so you're looking at a total of 90 tonnes being pulled. The engines on the front are doing the work and the rear engine is there as a brake. Just listen to those engines working. It gets even better in the wet. And every so often they get a chance to travel on the road. This is a special load to celebrate 25 years of the Great Dorset Steam Fair. Thousands of people turned out to see this event, which was a huge success.
And finally, the most recent exploits of the heavy haulage men was to move a Sherman tank by road. Just look at this. The organisation behind doing something like this is colossal. You have to have the police, the council and the cooperation of many people before you can do it. These heavy haulage men are determined that while ever they have a chance, they will always put on a show for the public. One of the most spectacular sights in Great Britain is the Great Dorset Saturday Night Fair. Each year it is the highlight of the show. Most of the steam engines make their way to the fairground and park opposite the line of showman's engines. There is a great atmosphere. Showman's engines with humming dynamos power the old-time rides that were commonplace in Grandad's era. The mechanical organs play their tunes as people ride around on carousels. Everybody is here to experience the magical sight, which people have reported hearing as far as Bournemouth, some 20 miles away. The fair is extremely popular and it has been known to keep going until well after midnight. <laughs> 